doesn't have notice. There we go. Hey guys, Jeff from Home Renovision. We are live again. We're here tonight for a uh, special edition of Ask Me Anything. And the reason we're here, because I've been delinquent. I have been traveling for the last three weeks. And to be totally honest with you, the first thing I did when I went traveling was go to a YouTube conference. We learned about security and cybersecurity, and I was paranoid to touch my computer because I was not up to speed. Anyway, so while we're doing all of our traveling, my computer broke, I had security issues, and uh, I was unable to get into the forum. And so I was way, 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 be, way behind. I'm back. It's the first day back in Florida, and we're doing a live show. So we figured what better thing to do than to jump live on with the live for members only on the chat tonight, okay? So if you're watching this and you're frustrated, you can't get a question in, it's because we're answering members' questions only, trying to make sure that I'm here to help everybody that I promised I would help and answer their question. So tonight's the night, guys. If you got a question, dive on in there. Otherwise, I am setting time aside for the next few days. I'm going to catch up on all of my forum questions. So please forgive me. Um, life has been busy and wonderful things are happening. So yeah, we uh, did a live show from the Sudpack House. I don't know if you caught that. If you didn't, make sure you check that out. And we... Uh, did some new stuff with a lot of traveling. Did some work with Roger Wakefield. Um, he's the plumber that was on our channel there not too long ago. Say hi in the chat if you're here, guys. Uh, if you're glad to have me back and doing live shows, give this video a thumbs up. <laughs> the more people that give a thumbs up, the more YouTube will share this uh, live stream with other opportunity for other people to learn about it. That'll be great. The more the merrier. The bigger our channel gets, the more we're able to help you guys out. And that is really the goal. I uh, just living in the dream here. I make a living helping people, and I love it. So I'm not going to teach or preach or talk too much tonight. Just going to jump right into your questions, make myself available to help answer some of those questions. You know, renovations is a tricky thing. So when you're asking questions, give us your geography. Uh, give us the age of your house, the best of your understanding. Try to describe your building science so that's relevant and be ready for some conversation. So if I, if I get into a question... Um, Matt's going to be watching the stream. So if you have a question, you can answer it. We can probably do some follow-up if we need to. I got the whiteboard here. We can draw some pictures. Uh, you know, I'm no artist, but usually we can make some scribbles make sense. And if you uh, have questions and you're not a member, well, join the membership and then get in on the fun tonight. Okay. That's it. Rules of engagement. Nice and simple. Uh, right out of the gate. Um, I've got a big TV right over here so that I can see because I am getting old. My God. And Matt is going to be working in Ottawa, bringing questions up. So this is the way that we're going to flow. Uh, be patient. If we don't get to your question, just ask it again. Okay. We're going to try to handle a couple of the early ones and then try to stay relevant in the chat as much as possible. All right, Matt, uh, without a further ado, what do you say? We jump into the first question. Uh, John was here bright and early and he's wanting to know, Oh, nah, he's just mentioning he loves the channel. There we go. His question is this. He's got a 1965 house, zone 5-6, and that's the um, climate zone. So Kingston, Ontario, uh, very similar to a lot of the north Midwest areas, okay? Removed old subflooring. What do you recommend for a rigid floor insulation? Huh. Huh, huh, huh. So you removed old subfloor. I'm assuming... You might be talking about a basement scenario here because in Kingston, generally, we have basements. John, I need to know the subfloor on what level and what is your flooring? Are you slab on grade or are you a traditional Canadian house and this is a basement, okay? So looking forward to following up with that. He has more information here, a little bit further down. Okay, no, that's not me. I'm just trying to read ahead and it's not working. <laughs> so cheers. All right, we'll, we'll follow up with John on that. Uh, Rock wants to know how the Florida house is coming. Well, Rock, the truth is this. The master bedroom's done. The closet's done. The master bathroom is completely finished. Uh, the kitchen is half renovated. I have flooring in the entire house. Most of the house is painted now. And now that I'm back, I'm going to be working on finishing the kitchen in the second bathroom. And I'm going to be painting the driveway in the garage area. And, um, you know, doing a few odds and ends and fixing up the trim. So, it's generally, I'm looking at filming for the rest of November, and then this project should be done. Ah, and then I'm going to take a bit of a, a break because I've been real busy schedule. But the, the Florida house has come along real well. It should be on the market sometime uh, just after Christmas. And uh, looking forward to moving on to the next one. Our next project house is going to be back up in Canada. We're looking to buy a three-bed, two-bath with an unfinished basement and completely rebuild that home. 
That'll be our next steps. And that'll probably take me and Matt, because Matt is going to help me on that. Uh, with the helper, we can probably knock that off in five or six months, no problem. So we're looking forward to what next year has for the channel to offer. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, Andrew wants to know, he's got a house, 1982 in Nova Scotia. So cheers, everyone, outies. Existing two by four studs in place, half inch from concrete. Hmm. Okay. Um, fiberglass bats touching the concrete. My plan is to replace the bats with cut and fit two inch XPS between studs and foam gaps. Thoughts? Huh. Well, when you're, when you're dealing with a two by four stud, generally you don't have the greatest opportunity for a thermal break, right? Um, my experience with older homes, when you're running in that kind of situation with a two by four, it's not so much the thermal value that you're going to get because the four inches of two by four really restrict that. So if you're going to go to rigid, that's fine, but you got to foam all your gaps on that rigid installation. Okay. You need a thermal break wood to wood. One of the biggest issues you got to deal with is the, the drafts that come with it. So if you don't have a nice tight air seal with that rigid to the framing, you're going to run into a draft situation and drafts create condensation, which create ice in the wall right? And then that ends up becoming mold. So that's your challenge. You've got to get airtight. So we use a vapor barrier to keep the moisture from inside the house transferring into the outside. And all through the winter, that's the process. Moisture from inside transfers to the outside. So if you can get a good vapor seal on your framing, I would even go with a rigid insulation if you wanted to increase your R value and then put in a bat, okay? Go with like a half inch rigid spray foam it and then bat as well. And even if you compress the bat and it doesn't get the full 13, you're going to get 11. 11 plus the 5 is a heck of a lot better than the 13 that you're going to have otherwise. And you end up with that nice rigid air seal because you're going to foam that in. It's a lot of work. may not be necessary. You might find that if you're going to open the walls and insulate an old cavity, you're better off to just put in a nice thick bat and do a proper 6 mil poly vapor barrier and use the um, acoustic sealant on the edges to get an air seal. And that does a great job. I did that in my farmhouse. There was no need to go and spend extra money and extra labor and extra frustration trying to put rigid foam in, in, cell, in those cavities. Rigid foam is really great on large surfaces like on your basement walls before you build your wall. But in stud bays, I would probably say not really necessary. You're going to spend a lot of extra time and a lot of extra pain. All right. So just go find yourself an R14. They do make an R14 bat for a 2 by 4 wall now. Get yourself a six mil poly, use the sealant, get it air sealed. And without any drafts, you'll be able to turn the thermostat down and it's going to really perform well for you. Okay, so cheers to you. Appreciate that question. Uh, Russell in the house. Russell, he's uh, recently bought a 1960s brick ranch with the basement. Love it. I was actually hunting for one this year, but man, in my area, they were just ridiculously overpriced. He discovered there's no insulation in the exterior walls. And no air gap, Zone 5, Colorado. Should I add vapor barrier? Which insulation? Okay. Zone 5 in Colorado probably has a vapor barrier. You're going to get cold. Um, don't know what the code is in Colorado. Is it plastic or paper? Best to just contact your local building office whenever you're in doubt, guys, about your zone and your, your local code, okay? Because it's not about does it get cold in the winter, it's about what's the, the most seasonality. So every, every region has its own code based on the weather patterns for the region because plastic in a house can be dangerous if it's not done right. So, you know, don't take it from me. Take it from your local building officer. Uh, weather patterns are changing, and some of the rules in certain districts are changing too. So feel free to stay up to date with what's best for your home. You are going to find that if there's nothing in your walls and then you open them up to put insulation in and you can... If you have the ability to add that plastic, like I said, you're going to kill all your drafts. Your energy bills are going to go straight down. You're just going to save you a ton of money. That's going to make it a lot more comfortable, right? Like drafts are dangerous because they can actually make you sick. If you have a draft in your bedroom when you're sleeping, you're going to end up waking up with a head cold. That's just the way she works. Anyway, cheers to you, bud. Uh, next question. Okay. Soul struck. Uh, Jeff bought this property, but I need to replace the top and bottom plate on an exterior wall. It's Rotted House in Mississippi, if that matters. Um, not really. If you got to replace your plates, uh, yeah, it can be a significant project. 
right? Like depending how much you're talking about. But generally speaking, whenever we're doing um, repairs on structure, the process is always the same. You build an interior wall two feet from where the space you're working, okay? And you build it so if the floor joists work like this, you build your wall like this to pick up the rafters, which we're going to be in the same direction as your floor joists. It's basic construction on most homes, unless you've got some architectural delight. But generally speaking, everything lines up like this. So you build a wall contrary to that, two feet back, and now it carries the weight of the roof that allows you to open it up and remove sections, top and bottom, do all the repairs. And then when you're done, you, you're, you're taking on that load on the outside wall again, you remove the interior wall. It's really that simple. The way you do it is you put a board on the floor and a board on the ceiling, and then you measure the actual gap and you cut everything one eighth of an inch longer than it needs to be. Okay, you put it in on an angle, you tap it with a hammer, get all the boards straight, put on a, another board on an angle on the side, screw it all together, That'll carry all the load you'll ever need. Ah, if you want to be extremely careful, you get a structural engineer and they'll they'll spec out a drawing exactly like I just said. And uh, if that helps you sleep tonight, great. If you want to get a permit just to protect yourself, you can. But uh, that is the process. So at least you have the knowledge about how to make that happen. Uh, replacing rotten wood in a house is not dangerous as long as you take care of it one section at a time. Okay. You can't do all four walls at the same time. <laughs> all right. So just uh, take it one step at a time and you'll be fine. Cheers. Anna, I'm new, but have learned a lot about doing my own projects through the channel. Uh, cheers, Anna. My 70s house with copper pipes has a shower that shares a wall with and leaks into the garage. Would love your help. Huh. Yeah. So why would a shower be leaking? That's the thing. Now, if you're going to deal with a shared wall into a garage, you got to remember that the garage wall is there for two things. One, it's there um, as a thermal break. Okay. Garages usually aren't conditioned space, but more importantly, it's there to provide a, uh, a seal of any potential gases, carbon monoxide from engines of getting into the home. That poison is no joke. Okay. If you watch enough, um, Murder mystery movies, you'll, you'll see somebody ends up killing somebody in the garage by just knocking them out and throwing them in the car and leaving the car on. And that's real. So what we have in garages and building code is wherever the wall board meets the concrete, we actually have to seal that with something that doesn't dry out, okay? So we want to air seal that wall so that the fumes can't get in the house. If you have moisture in, in that wall is causing damage, your air seal is gone. So first thing, uh, don't be parking your car in the garage, warming up in the middle of the winter, okay, <laughs> until you solve the problem. Now, in a lot of cases, a shower, the valve itself is what's going to leak. <clears throat> it's going to have a couple of inlets, and traditionally, it is a compression fitting, so it's got male and female threads on the fittings in the valve. And in a lot of cases, if that isn't tightened properly, um, it can end up breaking, okay? So, or you can get inclement weather that can cause a crack. And then it's just constantly dripping. So when you're dealing with showers, the first thing I always look at is the water supply to the shower valve itself. Because if something is compromised there, it'll be dripping all the time because water's always under pressure. And those situations can cause a lot of damage real quick. So get the cars out of the garage and open up the drywall and do an inspection. You've got to really just find out first what's wet, where's it coming from, and then you can make a plan to move forward. But until you get that air seal factor put back in place, don't want to use your garage to be keeping your cars. All right. Cheers to you. It's, it sounds a lot scarier than it is. You just got to apply a little common sense. Uh, Enrique, have great to have you back. Great to be back. My goodness. I was uh, October 2nd or 3rd traveling. I had brought the studio with me. So for the last three weeks, I had three bags. I had cameras and lighting equipment. I have my studio with me. I'm planning on doing live shows. Uh, and couldn't get it to work. The, the the hotels just didn't have enough capacity to make this happen, and it was frustrating. So we're going to find a solution to that problem so that I don't have to be dependent on hotels. Did my best to book places that claim to have high speed, but, you know, um, a fast cow is still just a cow. You know what I mean? Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's good to be back. Michael says, hey, Jeff, I want to build a freestanding half wall between two shower doors, how do I secure the wall so it's not wobbly? 
Yeah, that's a million dollar question, really, right there. Like the whole world has been trying to figure that one out for a long time. Um, part of the solution is this. You take a two by four stud wall, okay? And when you build it, you've got a top and bottom plate. And you want to use really good screws instead of nails to pull all that together. So everything is pulled tight together. And then you, on each side, you laminate a piece of half inch plywood. You screw it all along the bottom and the top plate and then down a couple down the sides. And what that does is now your plywood is cross grain. If it tries to move this way and the plate is really attached well to the ground, it can't stretch. It has no ability because when you move a wall like this, it actually gets longer. Okay, so plywood keeps it from having the ability to stretch. It makes it very rigid. Now, your bottom plate is where the trick is. The bottom plate, you've got to find your floor joist package and you've got to install it into that. So if your floor joists are like this and your wall is like this, you've got to be directly on top of a floor joist or you're going to have to open your subfloor and put in some blocking. So you've got locations to put nice, big, heavy bolts with washers. Driving screws won't work. You want bolts, carriage bolts with washers going through that plate into framing that's really nailed tight into your floor joist. It's a lot more prep than you think, but it does work if you do it right. All right. <clears throat> Let's get to the next one. <coughs> Excuse me. Attempting astrophotography. I'm just trying to get through a night without going horse. Uh, howdy from Dallas. Now, there you go. Cheers. Dallas was a lot of fun. I, the first part of my trip, I was in Irving, Dallas, just, just outside of uh, the airport. We're there for the conference. Beautiful, beautiful city, guys. Uh, but it might say your highway system, man, that is space age. Anybody ever been to Dallas Like, who's not from Dallas? What do you got? 20 lanes wide, two lanes, double stacked highway, four elevations on overpasses. Like, it's just nuts. Man, oh, man, you know, no drinking and driving out there for sure. That's just crazy highway. Um, I need to redo the ceiling of a small bathroom after a leak. Got it. How do I get drywall in up there? Just smaller pieces. Yeah, you know, generally speaking, um, uh, most bathrooms aren't any wider in one direction than eight feet, right? And so a four by eight sheet in a finished bathroom is tricky because you got fixtures. And if you find that that's the case, uh, what we do in a lot of situations, you, we've, I've seen people try to score the backside of drywall and bend it in half, right? And keep the paper attached, thinking they're gonna save work. That always ends up bubbling. So just do yourself a favor, cut it in the size that fits, try to keep it as long as possible so you only have joints going in one direction. Do all your butt joints. It's going to be a lot more taping, but if everything's jointed in the same direction, it will make your life easier because you're basically going to just add one extra finish coat. Go on Amazon, use our link in our video description, grab yourself one of those 36-inch blades, okay? It's just like a great big squeegee for drywall mud. And you can do your whole ceiling in one pass, three feet wide, and you can skim coat the whole ceiling after you put all those tape joints in. It'll make your life a lot easier because bathrooms, unfortunately, are going to need a perfect look because it's going to be a smooth surface and you're going to have usually a glossy paint or a lot of a lot of acrylic in it because of the moisture and it makes bad drywall work scream. So it's all about how you finish. Get the wide blade, get a great quality level five finish, and you're going to be really happy with work. Ah, Frank wants to know, Jeff, I need vinyl plank flooring. <laughs> Don't we all? Uh, what glue would you recommend using to gluing? Wow, one, three sides. Second question. I don't even understand. The first one, gluing DR, doing, gluing down three side. Okay, second question, do I keep the fattest side on the plank and cut three other sides? Not exactly sure what you're going through there, Frank. Um, if you're putting vinyl plank in a place where you need to glue it, it's usually on a slab on grade. So uh, I'm gonna recommend if you're going slab on grade, don't get the plank that locks on top of itself. On the short side, it just hammers down. I did a video on my farmhouse. I had a great product. We hammered it down. Worked out great. The problem is, is after about six months, a couple of those spots, because the unevenness in my particular floor, allowed some of those joints to come loose, and we had to tap them back into place. Fine. But then we had to tap them back into place every week, and it was getting a little maddening. And so um, I've developed my, my recommendation for vinyl flooring to be one that has tongue and groove on all sides. And we actually have a video coming up. I used a product like that here in this project. I show you how to install it because you can go left, right, front, and back with it. 
you just have to have the right information, know how to maneuver it so it doesn't drive you nuts. But if you need the glue, just make sure you don't have an under pad on the back of it. Yeah, that is the issue. Okay, Steve-O. Hey, Jeff, what's the best way to waterproof a block foundation from the 50s in Calgary? Exterior waterproofing or the interior? Okay, Steve, here's the answer. Both technologies are very effective. French drain on the inside with the water vapor barrier membrane diverts all the water to a drain system, goes to your sump pump or your lateral pipe and straight up to the city. That's fine. Waterproofing on the outside does the same thing. It sends all the water down the building wall, goes into the same weeping tile system, goes to the same lateral, goes to the, right? They both work. The only difference is they're both priced the same in most jurisdictions, except for this. If your basement is unfinished, it's cheaper. Or if you have a lot of landscaping or decks or that sort of thing on the outside that you have to move and then reinstate, then the inside's cheaper. Okay? But if your basement's finished, then and you don't have much going on, on the outside, then the outside is cheaper. So it really all depends. And then when did you want to get it done? Because you're in Calgary, you're running out of window before the freeze comes. And when you got make guys work in the cold, they're going to charge you extra because they're going to heat it, okay, and it's going to move slow. And every time they get a storm, they're going to have to stop and clean the job site. So just consider that. Really, it all comes down to I would find one company that does both, okay, and then have that conversation about the most cost-effective situation. OK, because they're they, as far as effectiveness is concerned, they both are 100 percent effective. If that helps, it really comes down to um, what's the easiest to manage, because you want to keep your scope of work as small as possible whenever you're doing a project like that, because you're going to get a benefit, but you're not going to get the cost return benefit on it. That's what I really what I'm saying. All right. Joe, you got mold spatter spots all over the bathroom ceiling. Can I go over it with mold killing primer or anything else to buy some time before I'm ready to renovate it? Okay. Uh, yeah, if you've got mold on the ceiling and it's a surface issue, okay, and this happens, like let's just be honest here, um, people have dead skin, okay? Heating systems move air, okay? Um, grease, we're shedding it all the time. So it's not a big deal if a ceiling has got organics on it hair rots but it, it gets stuck because of moisture all these organics that are flowing in and around a bathroom if they're not washed off will start to rot and mold in place so try this get yourself a, um, a spray bottle or something with a little bit of bleach in it like a bathroom cleaner and just try cleaning your ceiling if it comes off it's surface mold if it doesn't come off it means it's moldy in behind and the mold's growing from the wood framing that the drywall's attached to, that's a different beast. If that's going on, you want to paint your ceiling with a flat oil primer, that'll buy you at least six months, okay? And the goal there is going to be to isolate that mold from the water that's coming at it from the bathroom. And oil paint is a vapor barrier as well, so it'll separate that. So that's my advice. Um, and, you know, the sooner you can get to it, the better. All right? Cheers, buddy. Hello, I'm a first time home buyer. I have some renovation to do. Can I send you pictures and can you give me some ideas? You're from New Jersey. <laughs> um, yeah, you can send me pictures. I'm more than happy to jump in. Uh, ideas, careful, because I got a lot of ideas. Cheers to that, huh? Yeah, if you're new guys, we do have a forum um, that I'm behind on, admittedly. Sorry, but I've been doing a lot of traveling if you missed the pre preamble in the beginning. Um, it just got back down here in Florida. You can send me pictures, and you can you can definitely uh, get some of my opinions on that. I would be happy to share them with you. All right, where are we here now? Maddie, I want to put a half wall between two shower doors. Okay, six by three shower. How do I secure the wall? Let me get this straight. You got a, a shower that's six by three. You got two shower doors and you want a half wall in between them. I guess the question here is, is that is that half wall going to be designed to be structural? Is it going to have any of the weight of the hinge action of those doors on it? That's my only concern here. If it's just a half wall and it's cosmetic and you're creating a his and hers and you're doing custom doors with hinges here and it closes to here, and you're going to half wall and you're going to do a little glass panel and then a, you're fine. OK, 
Okay. Um, you just want to watch the very beginning of this video because I explained in very great detail how to build a half wall that doesn't move around. <laughs> so there's your answer. <laughs> Hit the rewind button when you're done, bud. All right. Let's go. Uh, Fox, I got a 20-year-old Fox Mulder. Yeah. That is an old TV show. I have a 20-year-old house. Wood vertical siding, South Texas. Okay. Some rot around the windows from AUC units. Do you think I should redo the entire outside siding or just patch Pacific sheets? Ooh. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, it all depends on the condition of the rest of the siding. Like, if as long as the woodwork has been up, up kept with um, proper maintenance as far as hedges and bushes and, and painting regime, wood can last a really, really long time. And so when wood fails because it's been introduced to too much moisture, you can replace the wet part, paint it back in, and it all looks the same. So that's kind of where I would head right out of the gate. Now, if all along the bottom you're seeing rot because it's been exposed to organics and garden beds, and then you've got mice and everything else going on, so definitely want to fix all that. But uh, um, right now in our economy, I'm going to say that when you're doing maintenance, and this is really a maintenance, I'd say less is more. Try to keep your scope of work as minimum as possible. Return on investment on fixing little issues like this just isn't happening right now. Everything is sitting on the market. And if you're ever in a position where you've got to sell, um, you don't want to have put too much into it, okay? Here I am telling you not to fix things right now. <laughs> Makes any sense at all. But be smart about it, right? Keep your scope of work as little as possible, guys. All right, I'm turning the basement into an ADU. That's nice. The important thing is to manage impact noise. That's one of the important issues. Yeah, what's the best approach? Impact noise. Okay, so impact noise is a noise that comes from above. If you're living above, then you want your client to be happy who's living underneath you. You need to manage the impact noise from floor transfer from where you live to their house. Now, you can do a lot of impact noise um, reduction techniques when you install your flooring in your own unit. But I'm assuming your unit's done. So the best way to solve the problem for the people underneath you is to go as follows. Ready? You want to put in two layers of R30 insulation in your floor joist cavities. Okay? Consider the idea of putting in a hat channel, which is metal channel, and then putting in two layers of 5 8 drywall underneath. It's an extra layer, but it's going to help a lot with killing a lot of that noise. Okay? That is more than the code requires. You do not have to create utopia for your client. You just have to be reasonable and considerate. So don't get into that mindset of, I'm going to spend $30,000 isolating noise from upstairs. Okay? People who live in a basement are comparing your basement to other basements. And so the building code is very, very simple. As long as you meet or exceed it, you've done your due diligence. Don't invest and overinvest. All right, some of the greatest ways to create um, an environment that's really enjoyable is to learn how to love classical music and leave it on just a little, little quiet. Keep your own ambient noise going. All right, you never hear your neighbor. All right, <laughs> let's see what we got here. Uh, oh, should a 14 by 50 foot shed? Is that a shed? <laughs> Bunker that's going to be heated with vapor barrier and insulation be sealed with acoustic sealant in between the framing. Wow. Okay, Marvin, that's a hell of a question. I do not know where you live, so I can't answer it. Um, Marvin, I want you to put in the questions again uh, where you're from. Remember, guys, where you live makes a difference. Building science from Alaska to Florida changes about five different times. So we cannot answer generic questions like that. You got to be specific, age of the home, and where you live. And then I can plug in the old brain here and give you, spit out an answer. Otherwise, I can give you the wrong advice as making assumptions. And I don't want to do that. All right. So uh, jump back in the chat and let us know. And we'll get back to your question as soon as we can. Cheers. Anna, not sure how to fit all the information needed in 200 characters. <laughs> That's a really good point. I'm located in Georgia. I think my shower is leaking because of the drain. I took off the cover and it's just concrete for a few inches. Hmm. After watching your shower renovation video, I'm thinking something is missing to funnel the water into the pipe. Maybe I can try pieces and see if anything fits to attach to the pre-existing pipe. 
Ah, yeah. You know, Anna, and this is one of these situations where uh, membership has its privileges, okay? Because you can go and take a picture and upload it into our forum. If you need help with that, go to the community tab on the main page. There'll be a link there. Um, my wife, Michelle, actually helps to people with, in the email if you have trouble logging into the forum. We're looking at ways to making that a lot more simpler so we can communicate faster. But a picture is worth a thousand words. So you only have 200 characters here, but if you send me a picture and ask that question in the forum, I'll be able to help you a lot more efficiently. Because yes, there are a lot of creative showers that have been made in this world. Let me just try to throw a guess at it. I would say 80% of the bathrooms made in North America since 1974 did not meet building code, um, even though they're new house construction. And I would say uh, nine out of 10 renovations done in North America since 1974 have been done by people who were not trained on the products, didn't understand building science, and therefore did things that could look pretty and then ultimately would fail. So we have a massive problem in our industry with a gap between the technology and the training. And then compound that with people who have a, a, a gap with integrity or skills development, right? So there's a lot of combinations and ways that you can have a problem. Uh, all it takes is for one tile to miss on this space shuttle and it burns up on reentry. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like showers are complex. You, you screw one little thing up, the whole thing just rots out. So it's tricky. Now on this channel, we got ways to help you make a shower, but if you got to diagnose a problem, send me pictures. Ah, uh, TJ, you got a basement leak from rain. Oh, coming in behind drywall. Okay. I removed all the moldy drywall at the bottom. Should I continue removing undamaged drywall to find the entry? I don't know how else to access the puddle. Yeah, so here's the thing. If, if you're getting a puddle when it rains, you got to figure that one out. So there's a few different ways that rain gets into a house, okay? I'll just rhyme them off real quick so when you're looking, you'll know what to look for. Um, window wells, okay? If you've got a window well and you have a window, you've got concrete, and then they stick a wooden thing in there and there's a space that has to be sealed. A lot of times the window well gets full of leaves or it doesn't have a drain and the rain lifts up and then it comes in underneath the window sill. So between the window and the concrete, rain can get in there. Um, where I live, insurance companies don't even insure that kind of failure. So manage your caulking, people. Uh, secondly is you could have um, electrical wiring. They drill a hole through a plate or on a wire to a light. Okay, that's an easy place for water to leak to. So it can come from the second or third story floor or it can come down through the facade, siding above brick, water gets pushed in behind the siding, comes all the way down, and then maybe somebody got creative and plugged the weeping holes on the bricks and then it builds up. You got, you know, uh, you got pressure and it finds its way underneath the concrete. There's a lot of ways for water to go, but the way you find it is you open it, you inspect it, you follow the water stain. It always leaves a mark, okay? Water's always carrying dirt from where it came from. So it always has a stain. So even if it's a week after the rainfall and you open something up, you're going to see the stain and you can trace it back. I tell the story. I had friends in their, their dining room, this two-story home, main floor dining room. The hardwood was getting all corped, cupped and warped. There's nothing wrong with the windows or anything else around the dining room. I was like, well, this is crazy. We've got to open the wall and find it. We traced it upstairs through the bedroom into the attic and we found that there was a mushroom vent, one of those flat little vents on a back side of the roof on the north side of the building. And in Canada, we got so much snow that the heat loss from that vent melted that, and the water came in and it followed through an electrical line, went in and around, hit a window, went around, didn't, blah, 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 found the hardwood floor. Right? You're getting three, four ounces of water a day for a month. Well, that's plenty. That'll screw up your floor. Doesn't take much. That's why when you're building, guys, you got to be vigilant. Okay? Really, really, really think through your process and don't say that's close enough. Um, <laughs> Mother Nature does not give a rip about close enough. You've got to be really, really specific. Michelle, I have a 1933 home in Rochester, New York. Well, that must be lovely. It has lath and plaster. Oh, my favorite thing to hate. I removed lath, plaster, and going to drywall, but dealing with old and new two by four studs, struggling with getting flat walls for drywall. Yeah, well, because they're different sizes, right? That's the trick. <clears throat> so generally speaking, a new two by four is going to be exactly three and a half inches. And an old two by four from 1930s is actually four inches. So what you can do is make your life easy is you can take all your two by fours that you're, you're building in and tying in 
and you cut, you go buy yourself a couple sheets of half inch plywood and just rip strips, okay? And then buy crown staples and just <laughs> throw some crown staples on that and make it the same dimension as the old lumber, all right? The only other option is you buy two by six and you rip it all down. I think the plywood's an easier option and you always nice to have half inch plywood around when you're in an old build for shims, right? There's always weird things that are happening. So do that for yourself. Make your new two by four, two by four is the same dimension as the old two by four for the thickness of the wall and it'll save you a lot of headache. All right, cheers. What material would you use to replace some rotten pressed wood siding boards? Okay, so that sounds like an exterior. Um, here's the thing. If you're going to, if you've got a, uh, wow, if you've got a facade on your house and it's rotting and it's more than 10%, you can assume, Paul, that the entire building is rotting or will rot sometime in the next five to 10 years. Your facade has now lost its value. Okay. If it's isolated to an issue related to uh, overgrown hedges, it holds moisture against that wood all the time. That can happen, right? So remember, guys, keep your bushes trimmed back. Whenever things are attached to the house because they've overgrown, you're trapping moisture in that location, and that moisture causes damage. It's not just, oh, the bushes are overgrown. No, the bushes are overgrown, moisture's trapped, mold is growing, things are rotting, okay? Bugs are moving in. Like, that's the cycle of life in a building. So if you've got decay, you've got to really uh, analyze how much decay are we dealing with. If it's one corner of a house because there was one overgrown bush, isolate the repair to that area. Try to get something similar, all right? But a lot of times old building materials you can't find anymore. So then you're like, I'll do the whole back side of the house, one facade. And by the time you're done that, you might realize this is going to look silly. Maybe we got to do the whole facade. And if you do, that's fine. It's not, not too big of a bite. Everybody can do their own facade. You can do your own vinyl siding. It's not that scary. But uh, identify, once you hit more than 15%, you know that whatever's going on with that product, it may not stand the test of time that you're looking for. And so you might have to say, okay, I got to do a repair this year. Let's make a three-year plan or whatever to put the money aside to do the whole facade. And that's kind of how I would attack it. If it's a temporary fix in order to keep the moisture out, do it, even if it's ugly. But then make a plan to fix the facade so that you can get that house value returned back to where it should be. All right, let's go where we are. The thing. <laughs> you guys in your names. I tell you, I'm stripping house down to the studs. Good man. Pacific Northwest, 1971. If I rip out all of the drywall and insulation, is there a time limit for replacing it? I don't want to leave it unconditioned. Hmm. Okay, that's a great question. Now, the answer to this question is different for everybody depending where you live. Pacific Northwest does not get freezing temperatures, okay? So your condition question, actually, you're in the perfect time for doing this. Sometime in the next couple of weeks, you're not going to have excessive heat to deal with anymore. You're probably there already. Um, I would say you probably have until April to get the south-facing side of the house insulated at least, okay? Now, here's the deal. Insulation in and of itself is not make great air quality, okay? So consider that when you're going back. You can go all winter without a conditioned house. You're going to lose a little bit of heat. You're going to burn a little fuel. Not the end of the world, okay? But when you put your insulation back, until you, until you cover that insulation with your drywall, there's going to be a certain amount of that fiber that's getting into the air. So if you go mineral wool, the insulation is twice as expensive, but it doesn't put fiber in the air. Huh? Or if you use the brand new fiberglass from Fiberglass Pink, it reduces the fibers by like 90%. That's not technical data. That's my own personal experience talking. I was at the trade show last year. I saw that product. I ate it. I was like amazed. You could just snuggle up. It didn't get you itchy. When I've used it in my own jobs this year, I noticed that the fibers in the air when the sun comes through the window, almost nothing. So if you have kids or sensitive people with breathing issues, do a wall. Get it covered, all right? Because you're not using plastic in Pacific Northwest. And get your south wall face done first, the whole building. That way, when the spring comes and you start having the sun coming out in fuller strength, you're not desperate to turn the air conditioning on until you finish your project. And it'll buy you some extra time. 
I'm going to say you got about a good eight months from this point to insulate and hang that drywall. Hang it. Don't tape it. Just get it insulated and hung. Okay? And this season that you're in, you'll be fine. Oh, look at that. All right. Handyman Serene. Hey, nice logo. Hey, Jeff, in the bathroom, what's the best option to solidify a grab bar on ceramic if you missed a stud? Oh, the other end is solid in a stud. Thanks. Yeah, that's what sucks. Okay, so you got two options here. Let's consider this. Um, you're in a, you've got a tile wall, you're on ceramic. It doesn't matter what your backer board is, if it's cement or whatever. Cement board is better than drywall, but let's just say it's cement board. Whatever you do to attach that screw to that cement board, it's not as effective as having framing. It's not structural, okay? So the only option that you have, and I hate to say this because I'm going to get backlash, go find a hardware store that will sell you a $10 stainless steel toggle bolt, all right, and use that. And at least it gives you, when the fins pull out, it gives you a four or five-inch diameter with those three different pieces that's carrying that load. Your best option is to open the wall from the backside and add blocking. If it's a bedroom wall, if it's an exterior wall and there's siding and insulation, I don't care, right? Get the little red tool. Open up a couple of pieces of siding, cut through your facade, boom, put in some blocking. Because here's the deal. If you're putting in a grab bar, it's not there to stabilize somebody as they're walking under normal conditions. It's there for when they slip and they reach out knowing it's there, trusting it to save their life. And if it comes off the wall because you're cheap and they break a hip, that's on you, my friend. All right. Next. Andrew, 1940s home. All of a sudden, opening up the outside of a, of a wall and reinstating some vinyl doesn't sound like big a deal, does it? Uh, yeah. Uh, 1940s home, moving my kitchen. Looks like my new range hood is hardwired versus plugged in and outlet. You know, that's like 90% of ranges, can I just say? Can I put this plus gas cooktop on the same circuit. Both are from Ikea if that works. Okay, so that's a, that's a question about load. So if you have a gas cooktop only, okay, and it's not like a mixed fuel stove where you have electric stove, um, um, electric oven and then a gas stove, there's a difference. So here's the question. They're both from Ikea. Andrew, call Ikea. <laughs> they'll have the answer for you all right that's just phenomenal um yeah i i don't want to get into trying to figure out the load of appliances over a live show that's just not going to work out very well for either of us so i would say that in a lot of cases a hood fan um for a gas stove should reach 600 cfm and probably has a fan and a blower motor on it and probably should be on its own circuit if you try to cheap out, you're going to run into issues. You're going to hurt the efficiency of your motor and probably burn it out early if you're sharing too much power. Don't do it. All right. I know it sucks, but you're the one upgrading your appliances. So you should be the one paying for an electrician to run you a new circuit. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. <laughs> Laura Varga, we want to finish the basement in a 1990 house. Okay. Some vertical foundation cracks happens. Can't find DIY epoxy products to inject, only foam. Any suggestions to waterproof first? Yeah. So uh, a 1990 house, you're right on the edge of technology there. So you may or may not have an exterior foundation house wrap. It's a black or brown dimpled plastic. that goes right down the, the whole foundation. If you have it, that crack in the foundation, um, it's not as big of an issue because you're not going to get water coming through. Vertical cracks will exceed on the outside past that point because they only do the foundation wrap up to ground level, okay? And then you'll notice you got like 8, 10, 12 inches of foundation left. A vertical crack will, will go all the way to the top. And if you don't see it outside yet, you will, trust me. Concrete always goes all the way through. Cracks are cracks, okay? It's not a scratch, it's a crack. And that, boom, all right? So... If you can't find a DIY epoxy in your market, it's because they're, they don't really exist yet. 
There's an entire industry for crack repair people, and you have to buy a distribution license for that industry to get access to the product. And no one's really cracked into that market yet. Okay, so <laughs> bad dad joke, I know. Um, crack foundation companies, if you have more than one crack, can give you a deal because half the cost is just getting there, showing up and setting up the equipment. It's not a big deal. It's hand tools and it's injection technology and it's licensing. So you can get a good deal if you got to do more than one crack. But uh, I would definitely pay to have it repaired professionally. The injection repair kits should be stronger than the original concrete. All right. So you don't want to just shove whatever in that gap. You're not filling a hole. You're bonding two slabs of concrete together that will never come apart there again. That's the deal. And that's what's going to guarantee your moisture from never getting in there. Anything else can't do that. Everything else you're going to put in that hole is elastic. It'll stretch. And eventually water will find its way through. And that's going to get trapped in your wall. And that's going to go to mold. And then the cost of dealing with a mold problem 10 years from now is 10 times as much as dealing with the crack today. Okay? That's just the way that works. Sorry, Laura. Get it fixed. I know the pros feel like a ripoff, but the products are using work and they're paying premium dollars have the licensing to be able to use them. So until that changes, that's just the way the market is right now. Uh, Larry, hey, Jeff, been enjoying the content for years. Well, cheers, Larry. You got a 1975 ranch home with a full basement, northeast Wisconsin. There's a fireplace in the basement where the chimney went through the garage. I took out the fireplace chimney. There's a hole in the floor. Poor foundation. Okay. I knew there's going to be one more, Matt. Good job, buddy. How to fill in this space so it's sealed and can be driven on? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so here's the answer, all right? Um, so it can be driven on. I love the fact that you want to put 5,000 pounds on it. Whenever you're doing a, a concrete repair in a hole, all you got to do from the underside is grab some plywood and tap cons, close the hole, step one. Step two, get yourself an SDS hammer drill, rent it from a Home Depot or something, okay? And you're going to want to get the drill bit of the same size, maybe even a little bit bigger than some rebar that they're selling. And you just go around that hole and drill six or eight holes around that hole, about uh, six inches in, okay? And then grab some one-foot rebar, stick it six inches in, six inches out. And what you can do is you can mix some hydraulic cement, and you can, like, pour it into the hole, and then shove the rebar hole in, rebar in there, okay? And once you've got half an hour after doing that, you're ready to just mix up a couple bags of concrete, toss it in. That rebar is going to transfer load from one to the next, and you're going to be able to drive on that. No problem at all. And if you don't believe me, then you do what I always say. When you're dealing with structure, get a structural engineer. I don't know. We should do a poll one day. How many people actually got a structural engineer when I tell them to? Um, but uh, I'll just say that my quick fix is nine times out of ten, uh, six days a week, uh, 350 days a year. How's that? <laughs> I don't have no stamp, but it'll probably work. All right? Now we'll go that far. <laughs> All right. Uh, you Okay. Romaldo, please. You, my back wall on my bathroom did not have studs. It was just a piece of drywall on there. How can I add two platforms? Oh, oh, really? Somebody just floated a sheet of drywall on your back of your shower? Wow. Oh, man. You know... Oh, what I would give just to have a wall, you know, just a wall with a few bullet holes in it, just to remind guys that there's consequences. Listen, um, if you want to add lumber to an existing wall, it's not that tricky. You really, you want to just be able to get, um, uh, open up a space, get some access and, and use studs and screws. Get a bit extender for your drill. You can get a 12 inch extension bit for your drill, right? And you can get right into those cavities. So your drill is outside the cavity. And you can throw screws on an angle, and you can you can add studs to a top and bottom plate without too much difficulty. And if you're if you're not sure if that's working out, if you don't even have a bottom bottom stud, if you don't even have a plate, then then throw some um, uh, adhesive like PL Premium on your subfloor, and just drop a two by four in that. Okay, throw a couple screws into that bad boy, let it dry up overnight, and then add your studs. Okay, give yourself something to screw to top and bottom. Man, if, if that doesn't make any sense, send me some pictures. I'd love to see what you're dealing with. 
Oh my goodness. Okay, cheers. <laughs> Uh, spackle versus joint compound differences in when to use. All right. Well, cheers. Um, yeah, here, let me save you a couple bucks. Uh, spackle is really expensive. Okay. So two buckets of spackle like this are 20 bucks, or you can buy a whole box of drywall compound for 20 bucks. Spackle is just really designed to be a quick drying application. It still needs to be primed. Unless you're in a hurry, spackle is a waste of money. Okay, spackles for the pros who show up and got to repair and paint in the same day. If you're a homeowner, you don't need spackle. Just have drywall compound. And then you can you can blame me, guys. All right. Hey, honey, I did all the patching. Uh, I can't paint until tomorrow. <laughs> Saturday afternoon off. There you go. It's a gift for me to you. <laughs> all right. It's just a waste of money. Um, now, if if you really got a lot of work done, you I got to knock this honey do list off. Or, or, or then that's fine. You can make it fast. Um, but at the end of the day, whatever the product claims are, if you put on too much of it, they all shrink when they dry. There's moisture that leaves. It gets smaller. All right. Some of them claim, oh, non-shrink formula. Yeah, that's not zero shrink. It just means there's less shrinkage than the average mud. All right. So don't get too wild with the marketing and the branding. Um, all of it needs a little, a second application if it's a big hole. So if it's a big hole, you spray foam, trim it back, and then apply the drywall mud. It's a lot faster than two layers of spackling any day of the week. All right, next question. Alessandro, Jeff, quick one today. Chicago area, entrance door rusty on the bottom. Repair or replace? Okay. One thing about entrance doors, guys. The door and the top jam and the sides and the bottom. It's one unit. If part of it's going, you want to replace the whole thing because you can't take one section of that out and replace it. There's no parts in the industry to just replace just the bottom, okay? And if it's rusting out, you've got a problem with the way that you're managing moisture around that wall. So you got to sort that out too. You need to remove that door just to know what you got to do to fix it. Do I need tape? Do I need foam? Is there some something flashing that's missing? What's wrong with my building science? And if there's water at the bottom, is the floor rotting out? That's another good question. Things that rust when they're galvanized have been exposed to a lot of water and probably a lot of salt. Okay, so nothing lasts forever. Um, you're probably into the business of getting a new door, period. All right. Now, if you have a really nice expensive door and you can go shopping for a cheap door, and you can take a same size door frame and put a brand new door frame and then put your old door back into that old door frame. Sometimes that'll work, but be, be real careful to measure up all the details on that because every manufacturer has little minutiae that are different. So you can't swap out components. All right. They try to make sure that you can't take a $2,000 door and just put in a new jam and reinstall their $2,000 door because they want you to buy a brand new $2,000 door. You get the idea. Max, uh, previous owners made a sliding door that slides inside the wall. Okay. Effectively removing the two by fours and significantly reducing the rigidity of the wall. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, there, there is a, such a thing as a pocket door. Right? Pocket doors do work. And there are good and bad pocket doors. Um, if somebody put in a cheap pocket door, yeah, it's not going to have a lot of structural strength. That's true. That's just the way she is. And if you want to make it stronger, the only thing I can recommend is take off the drywall and replace it. And if you're doing pocket doors, here's the secret. Don't use regular ultralight drywall on the, on the, on the closing application. All right? Do that wall in 5 eighths commercial drywall. Or at very least half inch fire rated so it's got the fiberglass mesh in the drywall compound. It's a much stiffer board, okay? And that'll give you much better performance on your wall. Avoid a lot of that deflection issues that you're, you're finding. And uh, yeah, that'd be great. <sighs> Thanks, baby. All right, Lily, new engineer, hardwood flooring on top of the floor. 1986 bungalow, Montreal. Montreal, brown paper, and then tongue and groove flooring. Yep, no floor self-leveling. It's now lifting, I was right. Self-leveling required. <clears throat> okay. So you have brand new engineered hardwood flooring on top 
on the top floor of a 1986 bungalow. Yeah. You see that right there? The language bothers me. We have, we're having a, a language issue. Bungalow, maybe maybe in Quebec, bungalow means two-story building. Bungalow, in, in one of my understanding, is a single-level house. Um, but the idea of having brown paper, then tongue and groove flooring with no self-leveling, and now it's lifting. Here's the thing. There are two kinds of engineered hardwood flooring, Lily. Uh, one of them is a click together. It's kind of like a laminate flooring. It's just floating, okay? I use that product in the bedroom of my farmhouse. That video is there. You can confirm. The second kind is it's a 5 8 or 3 quarter inch hardwood, and it gets installed with nails or, or staples, okay? So if it's installed with staples, it shouldn't be lifting unless there's so much deflection in the building that there's weak spots, and then now the staples are being pulled out. So that's a possibility. If somebody installed flooring that's just a, a lay flat flooring and it's starting to come apart and lifting and causing issues, generally speaking, a 1986 building doesn't have that many problems, but it can, unfortunately. So back in those days, we were using dimensional lumber, which means solid wood, no engineering, okay? And the subfloors were nailed, they weren't screwed. The key, guys, when you're getting flooring work done on homes that are done before 2000, let's say, you've got to stop and go back in time and go, hey, we recognize that nailing a subfloor is no longer sufficient. We've got to screw it before we move forward or it damages the floor down the road. That's the secret. So if you have someone who installed new flooring in an older house and they didn't screw down your subfloor first, part of the responsibility is theirs. You're not going to get anything from them except maybe an I'm sorry. But in the future, make sure you always have somebody screw your subfloors down before you let them install the new flooring. All right. Yeah. Man, man, oh, man, oh, man. And, you know, it took 50, 60 years before we learned that lesson. Right? Because that's just life. Life, life, life. We used to call it charm when the floors are squeaky. Now we realize it's because... Um, we didn't have screws, but now that we have screws, it's no longer charm. Now it's negligence. <laughs> okay. Uh, how to seal poorly installed leaking vinyl windows. That all depends. If they're leaking and they're vinyl, you have a lot of different options. Um, a vinyl window that's installed properly doesn't leak. Okay. It, it, it has gaskets, it has tapes, it has seals. It has flashings. All these systems work together to divert water, and you should never have a problem. So if it's leaking, the only thing you can do is uninstall it to find out what they did wrong and then reinstall it right. Okay? That's, that's ultimately the only thing you can do. And you should be able to remove an, a window and reinstall the same window. You can remove it without damaging it. All right? You have to be patient sometimes. Um, sometimes you have to do some work on around the inside of the house, remove the window jam extensions. Okay. That sort of thing because the use of expansion foam to install windows. So it gets, it puts up a good fight, but if you're patient enough and you, you, you're like, you can uninstall a window, find out what they did. Uh, friends over at stud pack, just put in a couple windows, did a water test and they failed miserably. Turns out that the um, window manufacturer didn't send them the flange kit that goes with that window, that they had to attach themselves and then seal up. So when they attached the, installed the window, they're like, this seemed really odd. Paul was telling me, I don't understand this. This makes no sense that this is going to leak for sure. They tried their best to seal it up with what was on hand. But at the end of the day, they found out that the manufacturer just didn't send them the product that they needed. And uh, whenever you're working with a product you've never used before, you're going to run into a new problem, right? That's just how it works. So. Just be careful. Um, just think rain running down the wall. What's it hit? What's the easiest path? And you have to create the easiest path to divert it away from the inside of the house. If you don't, it'll find its way into the house. Simple. Let's get another question. Legacy Studios. Oh, cheers for the super chat, my friend. Uh, hey, I got a 25 by 30 foot backyard. That's a tiny little patch, right? That's cool with brick walls separating me from my neighbors. Um, wow, interesting. I want to build a privacy fence 
Can I attach my post to the brick wall or is it better to put posts in the ground? All right. Legacy Studios. Uh, hopefully you're still watching. I got a quick question for you. Are you in a place where you get frost? Is it winter or is it always not frozen? If it's not frozen, you can use that fence as your structure. That stone wall is your structure. And you can definitely attach to it. Okay. It's a really great cheat. If you get frost, then you have to install that fence as if that stone wall isn't existing because the stone wall might have a footing. And depending where you live and the depth of your frost, we can't, we can't guarantee that the stone wall is going to be um, as solid as we want it to be, if that makes any sense. So like if you lived in Ottawa and you had a stone wall in a backyard, I'd be like, wow, dude must have dug a hole five feet deep, put in a footing, and then built a stone wall. But if dude didn't, that stone wall is going to fail, and I can't have my fence attached to it. So it really comes down to how long you've been on the property, uh, what's your climate like. But yes, you can definitely attach a fence to an existing block wall if you have the right climate for it. All right. If you're not sure, join membership, send me pictures, tell me your climate and details, and we can double check that for you. Or if you're still watching the show, you want to throw in uh, another follow-up question, go right ahead, bud. All right, cheers. And then there's another one here. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Whitman, hey, Jeff, I got a 10 by 15, 10 to 15 loose tiles in my bath that I've removed to reinstall and regrout. Do I need to scrape off the old cement or can I bond new cement to it? Best way to remove super hard cement. Wow. So if you have tiles that are popping off the bathroom wall and the cement is so strong that you need to find a way to remove it, um, you've got issues. Generally speaking, whenever tiles are popping off a wall, it's because they're delaminating because maybe it was the wrong product. Maybe it was put on cold or too wet or too dry. Whatever's happening there, the tile is expanding, contracting the temperature and the cement isn't and it's delaminating and shearing right off. So you can install over existing cement. The problem is, is the buildup and you're going to see it on the face. Okay. So make sure that your cement is the right temperature. Your tiles are the right temperature. And it's not exposed to the air for too long when you go to put it back on. Now, if you've got a, a space that you want to chisel the, the thin set back, you can do that. The best way to remove super hard cement is actually a cup grinder. If you can get in there with one, depending on the size of the space and the size of those tiles. Um, yeah, and it's not pretty. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. It's not pretty. It's going to be blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, at the end of the day, you can use a, um, a continuous rim grinder wheel, like a four inch grinder wheel, one without teeth. Okay. Make sure it's just, so if, it, if you have an accident, it gives you a burn instead of a cut and you can go in there and you can just grind really slowly and grind your path. All right. And, uh, it's going to be a lot, a lot of dust and it's going to be silica dust. So make sure you're wearing a really good quality mask. Okay. All right. Now maybe we can just double check our comments all the way to the end here. See if the. Gentleman with the fence. I think that that was a super chat and he's not a member, so he couldn't follow up. There you go. Well, folks, listen, if you're not a member and you can't follow up, become a member. All right. Um, you got a, you got a $4,000 question you're asking. It's worth the five bucks. I can get you an answer. All right. <laughs> that, that's it for our hour today. Uh, I would love to go longer, but I'm still recovering. And I was in different time zones and I'm exhausted. It's been a hell of a three weeks. We will be back here again next week. And we are talking about, if I'm correct, the how to prepare, how to plan for your basement renovation. Winter is coming. It's the season for basements. I get it. My, my, my inbox in the members forum is just loading up with basement questions. So I figure let's do a dedicated show. Let's talk all about basements. We're going to go a little longer in that one, okay? Because we're going to take some questions and some calls, but we're going to deal with the whole process of how to prepare for one so that you can make the right decisions to save yourself time and save yourself money, save yourself aggravation, right? And then you can get a professional looking result and earn equity in your home. You are your best contractor and you don't have to hire nobody because you can do it your damn self. All right. Cheers to next time, guys. We'll see you then.